The country needs to know about it. The planet needs to know about what has taken place. And we've been lied to. I say this over and over. We've all been lied to for a minimum of 6,000 years. Uh, we're going to have to step back our thinking here to the people on this planet. Okay. They don't know there's extraterrestrials. Yeah. They don't know that there's not just one of them. Maybe we've got thousands. Maybe we've got billions of extraterrestrials. The latest number, just recently, uh, we doubled the number again. We now have 200 trillion galaxies out there. Bobby Ray Inman, was he alive then? I don't even know. Uh, he was just a, a, a kid then. So he wasn't. But Bobby Ray Inman later on became the number one yes. uh, admiral. He still is. Yeah. <laughs> but I'm just saying, he, uh, 26 years, he ran with the ball. Right. Okay? Yes. And he knew what he was uh, talking about. So they watched this event, and they immediately structured and organized this group of people pulling in all of the top scientists they could pull them in, put them inside a secret area, inside of an aircraft company. He put this organization together, which ended up being a major organization later on studying extraterrestrial and is still studying it. So are you saying that was the beginning of MJ-12? Yeah. Hi, I'm Carrie Cassidy from Project Camelot, and I am here today with a very honored guest. Actually, I should say guest, <laughs> but Michael Schratt is joining us, and he's going to be helping to ask some good questions to our very honored guest, and this is Bill Tompkins, and he is a phenomenal individual and a very courageous individual. And it's rare when you get someone like this who will come forward and tell the truth. And we've been waiting a long time for this, let me say that. So uh, Michael Schratt is an aerospace historian and very happy that he's here with us today. Uh, he has a very thorough background in aerospace history. And so that's gonna be a lot of help uh, actually, you may disagree with me, but I think you might be the first um, witness to come forward in in uh, the area of the secret space program, black projects, and who is actually, in a sense, sanctioned, being backed up by uh, a section of the military, I would say. Now, I don't know if you'd see it like that. I certainly know you're backed up by the Nordics. But, but I'm talking earthly civilization here. And I think um, in that case, maybe the Navy is, is behind bringing you forward. But I don't know if you're actually willing or even able to, to elaborate on that. But go ahead. Well, <clears throat> actually, it's uh, sort of a situation where um, I'm still involved with the Navy. And uh, I'm actually having to participate in naval programs. So uh, I'm, gonna, I'm gonna discuss as much as I can. You're gonna hit me with some questions and I won't be able to answer. So I think the easiest way to do, to just start this is to go back to 1942. Uh, actually, uh, for whatever reason, uh, I was selected by some people in the Navy, Naval Intelligence, to essentially be uh, assigned uh, a program to discuss the U.S. Navy uh, secret space operators who have been operating in Germany trying to uh, understand the uh, a tremendously complicated agreement between the SS and the Draco reptilian group who were assisting Germany. So this had actually gotten started uh, much earlier with a very lovely young lady 
uh, in Germany who was contacted by Nordic people to essentially get her friends to develop uh, the necessary requirements to build a large space transport, get their friends and the family to join into this, and essentially leave the planet and go to another star's planetary system. And this is Maria Orsic. That's correct. And so she actually was doing this from like the 19, uh, late 20s, 1930s. And it ended up in the studies that I got involved in with the information from the operatives in Navy operatives coming back from Germany uh, into Admiral Ricabata's secret conference room at the top building, Naval Air Station San Diego. He's commander, Naval Air Station San Diego, but he has a hobby, okay? And this hobby is roughly uh, 28, 29 naval operatives who in 1942 and possibly early in 41 were continually going back to Germany and studying all over the different research organizations what it was that the agreement had actually been made with Hitler, the SS, and the Draco reptilian people. Okay, but if this is happening in 41 or 42, the war is not over. Uh, the war is still on. But uh, this young lady that we're talking about had been contacted by Nordic people to help her get an organization together with a great deal of extraterrestrial assistance to design a propulsion system, design a vehicle large enough to carry 40, 50,000 people, get in this vehicle and leave the planet. Now the SS was not aware of this. When they found out about this, they took over a group of 1,442 people, which included scientists, and it included shoe salesmen, it included farmers, it included top research technicians. All these people were contacted by the Nordic extraterrestrials to assist people in Germany to get a vehicle built. So now we have a whole lot of civilians nothing to do with the military and with absolutely no desire to have the military involved in this extraterrestrial event, okay? Real important. When the SS found out what they were doing, they took over everything that she had structured and organized, all 1,443 people. They had been hawking their farms, they had been getting everything they could possibly get in a way of money to design and build massive size spacecraft transports. That's not what the SS wanted. So they took over this facility and they jumped in and grabbed everything. After only two months, Hitler made the decision, let her and her organization go ahead with what they're doing we're going to be working with the Draco reptilian group. So now we have two groups that we can get, and we can cut into them any time we want. We can take it over again any time that it was necessary. So actually, they allowed the second time for this group to design and build these spacecraft transports with which Many of them later on, even after, during the war and after the war, to leave the planet. Some of them went out and came back. They actually had large facilities that they utilized as in underground facilities in Antarctica. The Draco reptilian people had two enormous caverns, and I don't want to get off into that subject now, we can talk about it later but there are caverns all over this planet which 
different extraterrestrial civilizations have been using, yeah. okay, for thousands of years. Mm -hmm. Now, back to the SS. What the operatives found was an unbelievable series of situations <clears throat> that literally, when they gave their briefings to Admiral Riccobata, we also have one at least of three other Navy captains in, in his office at the time of this briefing. So sort of set the stage for this. Okay, can I get the year that they did the briefing with Riccobata? 1942. Still during the war? Still during the war. Incredible. Okay. Yes. Yeah. Now, Admiral Riccobata, well, there was a large table. The operative sat on the other side of the table. Admiral Riccobata sat here, I sat next to him, and one of the three Navy captains sat next to me. The typist sat at the end of the table. That's the only people that were in there. We always had the same people. Essentially, all of these meetings, all of these disclosure meetings took place at night. The Admiral's aide would wake me up wake me up sleeping in my barracks. He tapped me on the shoulder and all he said was, he's here. Uh, he escorted me across the facility over to this tall building, which is the command center at Naval Air Station San Diego. There's a small office near the top of this. That's where these disclosure meetings took place. So these operatives then brought back this information, which is even Admiral Riccobata said, I don't believe one word you're saying, young man. That came up over and over. Okay, can I ask you the name of the other, the other Navy captain, or are we not to know who that is? Uh, actually, I have to say I can't remember it right now, all so right. that gets me out of it. Okay. okay. Yeah, all right. <laughs> but I really don't remember. Okay. Okay. <clears throat> but uh, these operatives themselves didn't believe some of the information that they had to bring back and so all they tried to do as best they could is present a package of a, a package of information some of it even had manuals okay some of the manuals were in hieroglyphics all of the manuals were in german then they had photographs taken inside of research facilities in Germany. They had photographs of UFOs. They had photographs of maintenance people working on UFOs. They had photographs inside of the UFOs. Okay, now I'm gonna ask you, I wanna ask you something because these operatives, you're calling them operatives, were these regular human beings and how were they getting access to Germany at this time to get this information? Was this something that they were allowing the Americans to have? Uh, how, what was the relationship? Okay, basically, were they all of these young men were either lieutenant uh, JGs or full lieutenants in the Navy's intelligence. These people were all American German family people. All of these fellows knew Germany. They even knew all the accents in different areas in the surrounding countries. These are beautiful guys who were dedicated themselves to be essentially spies for the U.S. Navy. Okay. Um, now, this was totally unaware with the Air Force. All right. Everything that I'm talking about is on the Navy side of what took place way back then. Right. Okay. So these operatives would bring back photographs of the different vehicles. They would bring back data, uh, sometimes documents, all in German, and, and, or, and or some of it in what was then considered to be, the closest thing was to be um, essentially hieroglyphics that we found later on underneath the pyramids, okay? So that's the best description I can give you of what some of the data was. Obviously, this was information that was not given to Germany 
by extraterrestrials uh, using English language, where otherwise many meetings that took place later on with extraterrestrials, they could give you the information in 10 or 20 different languages. But that's not what we got, okay? okay? <clears throat> so they would actually attempt to tell this panel everything that they were able to find and what was most important. And we then would take that information, and I had 11 or 12 young ladies who could take this information, which the first girl typed, run copies of, and then put together different, what they called packages, which essentially were proposals, okay? okay. These proposals then uh, were then to be disseminated around the United States in secret facilities. Now, I want to make one point very clear here. Actually, what was on the Rents radio program last night was a document that actually was put together later at Douglas because Douglas got one of these packages. I personally took it to Santa Monica Douglas as one of the first of four top, not aerospace, aircraft companies which okay. became aerospace later on. Remember, everything that we're talking about here, um, I don't know how to make this clear. You're trying to decipher, you're trying to understand, not just other extraterrestrial people information, but everything that you're getting is totally unreal to every single PhD on the planet. I have to say, people don't realize what took place in 1942 in the Naval Air Station at San Diego. This is unbelievable. And it's not just a statement of unbelievable. You couldn't understand it. When the documents were then taken, and I had to use the one of the two airplanes that Admiral Riccobata had, he had a twin engine Lockheed Electra, which we used to fly back in the eastern part of the country to laboratories and naval bases. And then he had a seven passenger high wing single engine plane, which we flew to Douglas and to Douglas and to, I mean, into Lockheed uh, out on the desert to, to the Navy facilities out there. So we put together rough information and I want to try to explain what that information was. All it consisted of was a typed version of what the operative said, copies of that. Okay. Some documents, some photographs, some written uh, notes, like there might be as many as 30 pages of written notes that the operative would give to the admiral. Okay, now I'm going to stop you there and ask you, Rick Abada and yourself, can we get a little background on why you two guys were so instrumental in this process? Uh, now, I know something about you from reading your book, and I want to highly recommend his book. Uh, it, it's, it's fascinating. Uh, but I do want to share with the audience here, uh, you know, Rick Abada, you told me on the phone I think you said he was Australian and he wasn't trained in America. Is that right? Yes, and you're asking a very important question, okay, what you're asking. It's extremely important. Uh, we're going to have to step back our thinking here to the people on this planet. Okay. They don't know there's extraterrestrials. Yeah. They don't know that there's not just one of them Maybe we've got thousands, maybe we've got billions of extraterrestrials. The latest number, just recently, uh, we doubled the number again. We now have 200 trillion galaxies out there. Mm -hmm. And to say that we're the only intelligent people in this universe is naive. But we were, the people on this planet, 
were tremendously naive. They had no idea what these naval operatives brought back to what essentially was my delivering of these packages to the four top right. airplane companies, because they want aerospace. Now, back to your specific question. Who was Admiral Riccobata? He was born in Australia. He came to the United States, went to school, joined the Navy as a third-class seaman. He worked his way up. Now, what's extremely important about this is that my mission statement working for Admiral Riccobata was as disseminator of advanced aircraft research, okay? That was my, my mission statement working for Admiral Riccobata was a copy of 80% of his statement who was written by the Secretary of the Navy Forrestal, okay? The Nordics contacted Forrestal. I'm saying this, you don't believe it, this is what happened. They contacted Forrestal and had Forrestal selected, selected to initiate this whole thing in the U.S. Navy. Mm. Then Forrestal selects an Australian man, two-star Admiral Riccobata, to be the one person to disseminate this data that our Navy intelligence found out what was going on in Germany. And this is staggering because at that time, people don't realize that there's more than one uh, admiral in the Navy. Yeah. At that time there was 43 right. because there's so many areas that need support. Secretary of the Navy Forrestal selected a man who never went to Annapolis. Listen to what I'm saying. Mm -hmm. Every PhD on this planet, whether they're for science or for medicine have been given incorrect information for thousands of years about the history of this, not just this galaxy, the universe. Mm -hmm. They had been given information which was controlled by Draco, Reptilian, and other extraterrestrials not to know what was really going on. So every book in every university on this planet had misinformation sure. about every field, every technical field you can come up with, okay? Yes. So when the operatives had to carry this out, they were not asked to study these packages. They were directed to study these packages. These weren't, these weren't requests for proposal. This was a demand factor that this information that got typed up in the information in these packages to all of these research universities, to all of the top Navy laboratories, uh, the, uh, the facilities out at China Lake, the underground facilities at China Lake, Caltech. Actually, I didn't take the first package to Caltech in Pasadena. I took their first package to the uh, underground facilities out on the desert called China Lake. And it's just north of the Air Force facilities off of Highway 395 out in the desert in California. Right. And I'm saying people don't understand or realize or gasp. They don't get what has happened. And I'm not trying to build a story here. All I'm trying to say is, hey people, hey you guys, everybody that's listening to this program, okay? Mm -hmm. You people have been told for a minimum of 6,000 years total inf uh, incorrect information. Yes. 
from medical, from science, from history, from astronomy, from mathematics, you name it. Everything you've told. Yes. It's I, not, it's, I, it, it, I, I really appreciate you. Yes. This is a lie. I, I, I hear you. It's great. Can I ask you Go one ahead. thing about yeah. these operatives who went into Germany to get this information? Did they, we know there were spies from the, your description. Yeah. But so they were undercover, so to speak. Yes. And they must have seen the craft with their own eyes as well. Yes. Correct? Yes, absolutely. Okay. So in some cases they were working uh, on the craft even. They, yeah, they actually got on board, got inside. Right. They took photographs inside, stuck them in some place and right. managed to be part of the package that was delivered to Admiral Ricabata. Incredible. Now, what do you think? First of all, you're telling me Forrester had contact, and his contact was with the Nordics. They chose him. But was Rick Abada in contact? Or you said he sat there and just shook his head and said, I don't believe you. So he was not a person who had had any contact himself. Uh, you're referring to Admiral Rick Abada? Yes. Uh, to me, he was selected, period by the Secretary of the Navy over all of the standard admirals who had been educated uh, in uh, Annapolis. Because he had an open mind. He exactly. had a mind that would not have been controlled by the misinformation that every university on the planet has given. Was that your personal uh, take on him when you met him? No, not when I met him. Later on, I, this was obvious. Okay. okay, but then who's Billy Tompkins? Why did he, who, who selected Tompkins yes, exactly. to be on this committee? Right. Because I get pulled out of high school in the first year, halfway through the first year, the Navy pulls me out and puts me through boot camp. And then my orders say, report to Commander so-and-so, Naval Air Station San Diego. I'm only saying, I, I, I don't have a doctor's in, in these degrees that are required for all of these studies. Right. I don't have. Right. But then my mind wasn't clouded with misinformation like the Admiral. Okay? Okay, so, but to get back to you, and, and this, we've got this setting of this conference table and you're sitting next to Rick Abada and, and eventually you deliver out all these packages yes. around the, the uh, well, what becomes the secret space program, but the American. And I, did you take some to Britain? No. no, I only took facilities to the United States secret facilities. All right. Now, right away, I want to hit you with this. And, and this is important. Okay. Even the document that was on Rents Radio last night, it's called, it's a Douglas do document that was put together inside the secret think tank at Douglas, where I went to work many years after the Navy, okay, okay because I, I worked for Northrop and other people. Uh, but when I got into Douglas, they put me in this secret think tank. So that document is called, uh, it's a big thick thing, and it has the Douglas logo on the front of it, and it's called unconventional propulsion schemes, okay? And it doesn't have a confidential stamp on it. It doesn't have a secret stamp on it. Everything that we took, I took, I flew in the airplane, in the Admiral's airplane, to Lockheed, to Naval Air Development Center, a War Minister of Pennsylvania. I, I flew to all the top secret facilities. Not one document that was given had classified in any way given to them. Everybody knew it was way above top secret. Yes. No document was stamped. Mm -hmm. I hear you. Yeah, and I, I had heard that on one of the other shows. Uh, so the idea being that if it wasn't stamped, people wouldn't notice it. They wouldn't make a big deal of it. Yes. It would just pass through hands. If anyone whose eyes caught sight of that document accidentally, they wouldn't see it, yeah. so to speak. But it's an interesting way to handle the most classified yes. subject on the planet. 
Absolutely. Uh, well, actually, quite quite ingenious, really. <laughs> um, so again, I, but I want to get back to you because here you are. You're a kid at this point. I mean, right out of high school. I'm 18 now. 18. Okay, so you're 18 years old, but they've chosen you. I assume Forrestal and and the Nordics chose you. Did you already have contact with the Nordics before you went into this program? Okay, let's go back to uh, February 1942, okay? Okay. Um, they call it the Los Angeles sighting. Uh, what took place, actually my mom was back east and my dad, my brother and I had rented a large apartment in Long Beach and uh, California and this was a in a large home that had been broken into four apartments so the second floor actually is um, 30 foot ceilings down below of the so the second floor then is real high okay. and all the way across the back of this house it's only four blocks from the ocean in Long Beach all the way across the back is a great big uh, balcony uh, deck. So at about 5.30 in the evening one day in 42, uh, my dad says to my brother and I who were laying on the floor looking at the newspaper and the magazines, get up and come back here to the deck. So we get up and go out to the deck and here's this spot. A little spot okay just above the trees and just above the rooftops okay of the houses that prevent us to see the ocean from this this area okay. so we're standing there looking at this and all of a sudden out of this spot of light came a little beam and it went like that sort of about that 60 degrees and we watched that. Then this beam went straight like this, hit the back of the house, lit up all of the trees, lit up the back, the roofs of all the houses, everything was lit up. And we went back, hit the wall, and then go forward and grabbed the railing, okay? Um, it was gone. It was gone, okay? okay? So, <clears throat> We went back, we had dinner, <clears throat> listened to a sh show on the radio, went to bed. <clears throat> At about 1.30 that night, all of the anti-aircraft guns started firing. Uh, we get up, we run outside, and we look at this great big thing. At arm's length, it was that big. It was parked at about seven, eight thousand feet. I'd been a Navy pilot, flew almost everything that the Navy had. I knew what the altitude was. I knew what this thing was. There was eight searchlights on the bottom of this vehicle. Bang, bang, bang. All these shells were bursting on the bottom of this vehicle on a continuous basis for an hour and 30 minutes. Just parked right there. Now, all around it, above it, Different vehicles were coming. This last. This is the Battle of L.A. You're describing. This is the Battle of Los Angeles. Okay. But at that time, you were still a kid, right? Yeah. So you hadn't been a Navy, Navy pilot yet. No, no, no. But now, later on, you were able to remember what you saw and know that it was these. I knew what the altitude was. I, I somehow knew this altitude. Okay? Oh, really? Uh, yes, and. <clears throat> Later on, I did. I flew every, almost every plane that the Navy had. Um, so I the craft that you said, you said there's a, there was a, because there's a newspaper picture. I don't know if that's really the, the, the real thing. The, the newspaper was not a good demonstration of what took place. All right. Now, what I'm trying to say in, in evaluating what happened in this sighting, uh, You have to visualize dozens and dozens and dozens of different shaped 
vehicles. Uh, this great big one parked right on right above you, right over Long Beach. Okay, everybody is outside looking at this and watching it. We finally there's vehicles going on both sides of it. There's vehicles above it, and several times actually the vehicle went underneath, and the anti-aircraft anti gun lights, the searchlights, shined on them and followed them. So this goes on till about 2:30. We get bored. Uh, we all go back to bed. Okay? We get bored. Well, not, not, no, well, hold on. Happening. Just wait a minute. Hold on. Okay? We get bored. Yeah. Now, while this is happening, and it goes on until 5 o'clock in the morning, many of the other people outside, okay, outside <laughs> on the watching this from the street yeah. stayed up all night long yeah okay but better than a movie <laughs> okay no wait a minute just listen what it, now on the other side of your planet at this same time the germans were bombing london oh wow oh my gosh holy cats this is february 1942 right okay That's now we got bored and went to sleep. Now, I want to make a very important point about this, the Los Angeles event, the sighting. Okay. There were, nobody got scared. Nobody got nervous. Nobody ran in the house and jumped with yeah. the covers over their head, okay? Everybody watched this thing. Nobody got sick. Nobody got, nobody got uh, real sick, died. There weren't anything of that. The only people that were that were killed in this were from our own shrapnel. Now, people watched this same sighting, we found out later, from Santa Barbara. Mm -hmm. People watched it from San Diego. Sure. This is a massive group of vehicles. Now, listen to this analysis. you got to tell me. There's only two ways this could have accomplished what was going on. One, the extraterrestrials vehicle come in over the ocean, okay? Mm -hmm. uh, hundreds of them. They go all over Los Angeles. They go to uh, Santa. Uh, they go to the the telescope on Mount Wilson. They make a turn. They either go north or they go south. They fly out to sea, they turn around out over the ocean, and they come back to make you think there's a whole lot more vehicles there than actually there is. They either had to do that, or we watched thousands of vehicles come in over western United States from uh, 1.30 to almost 5 o'clock. Mm -hmm. And they shot at them and weren't able to hit them or destroy the, them. Anyway. The shells burst on the bottom of them. They're not bursting on the bottom. There's an electromagnetic shield, mm -hmm. but the shell hits and it blows up, but it doesn't do any damage. Now, yes, we did shoot down two small ones, oh, yeah? which were not occupied. Oh. One of those went in the ocean only a half a mile off the Rainbow Pier in Long Beach. Your Navy picked that up. So your Navy had an extraterrestrial vehicle in February of 1942. Okay, so that's before the operatives came back with the information. Because uh, you said in 1942 they had... Okay. Uh, <clears throat> this took place just before I was contacted, pulled out of high school, thrown over to Naval Air Station, North Island, okay? Mm -hmm. What this says is that a whole lot of people who were involved in this sighting uh, immediately knew there were extraterrestrials. Now. I want to take this a little further. People who watch this sighting, and this is not, it's, there's documents that prove it, but they haven't been released. Um, 
two Navy admirals, two Army Air Corps generals, and an individual whose name is Donald Douglas Sr. Those five people were in meetings that evening. They were still in meetings. They watched this whole thing. They watched everything. And bang, extraterrestrials. No, no cover up. They're real. Okay. So those fellows got together. Okay. Doug, just a second. Douglas then put this group together, the two admirals, the two army generals, Air, Air Force generals, okay. and they put together a group of people and initiated a secret think tank inside of Douglas, actually within one week of the sighting. Yeah, that's fabulous. And so, you know, we talk here that this is February 42, 1951. I went to work for that secret think tank inside of Douglas. I had been working for Northrop for two and a half years. I worked for North American for a short time. I worked for Lockheed for a short time. And then somebody telepathically told me I need to leave Lockheed and I need to go to work over in Santa Monica at Douglas. I didn't read a document that said do that. Okay. So I went over and applied for a job as a draftsman. Okay, no, I'm sorry, not a draftsman. As a model builder of metal wind tunnel models. Okay? Because remember I had built a group of models right. over quite a number of years. Yes. Uh, but but I, I still, I mean, I want to make sure that we have this, uh, the L.A. sighting, the L.A. Battle of L.A., because that was so amazing. And this is even prior to Roswell. Yes. Okay. And in essence, are you able to say who those other people are? Because you said Douglas is one of them. But the other admirals and generals that were in that meeting, that small meeting, watching all of this, who then put the the secret uh, think tank together, who they were. Is one Curtis LeMay? I mean... Yes. Okay. Um, <laughs> Bobby Ray Inman, was he alive then? I don't even know. Uh, he was just a, a, a kid then. So he wasn't... But Bobby Ray Inman later on became the number one yes. uh, admiral. He still is. Yeah. <laughs> But I'm just saying, he, uh, 26 years, he ran with the ball, right. okay? Yes. And he knew what he was uh, talking about. Yeah, oh, absolutely. So, uh, okay, but did, did, you know, the Battle of L.A. is going on, but at the same time, did any of the ETs in that craft, I mean, and do you know which ETs were doing this? Was it the Nordics? Did any of them, you know, teleport down to m meet anybody? Was there any reported encounters during well the, the let's go back hours. let's go back to douglas senior two navy admirals and two army air corps generals in a meeting okay they had been in meetings all day long they were still in meetings right because it's only 7 30 i mean come on uh, so they watched this event and they immediately structured and organized this group of people pulling in all of the top scientists they could pull them in, put them inside a secret area, inside of an aircraft company. Douglas Sr. did this, so you got to give him credit yeah, sure. for this. Now later on we had a lot of problem with his son in there because didn't, he didn't know what was going on. But Sr. was brilliant. He put this organization together which ended up being a major organization later on studying extraterrestrial and is still studying it. So are you saying that was the beginning of MJ-12? Yeah. <laughs> In a word, yeah. Uh, excellent, yeah. Okay. Was Forrestal one of the admirals? 
Uh, no. In that meeting? No. no. Was Rick a botter? Uh, no. So, are you able to tell me the other players in that room? Uh, what we, we know the beginning of, of MJ-12, actually. We know some of these players. Vannevar Bush? No. Uh, I just assumed sort of side. Juan Carmen. That. Yeah. I could go yeah. on. Yeah. Okay, I just assumed. All right, fine. Uh, kept no that problem. Uh, okay, so, so we've got that. But you didn't answer my question. Was anyone having contact? Any okay. high-level people contacting even before the event happened, in fact. Okay. My understanding on this was that nobody came down, nobody talked to the people that were in these vehicles, but probably thousands of people telepathically got information, okay? Okay. So ring, the bells were rung in hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of people. And you were one of them? I just happened to be one of them, I think. I can't prove it, but somehow... Uh, well, I mean, this is a good time to ask you. I mean, are there other guys like you? Because you oh, yes, seem very to be definitely. one of a kind. Yeah, no, there's a lot of other people. There's a lot of guys like you in, yes. in the, this secret space program who were somehow contacted and have had special guidance and knowledge on how to build and what to do. Yeah. Yes, yes. Others. Yes. And have you met them? Uh, really, uh, I've only met, th I've only met th three other individuals of what are probably hundreds, okay? Really? And, uh, and they're all quiet to this day. Uh, yes. Now, I think one of the thrusts that you probably have and that many people now are hoping that the disclosure information will get these people to come out and talk about their involvement. Sure. Okay? Right. That's, that's what I collect, the collectively we're all trying to do. Mm -hmm. Because there's many areas that I don't know about and that I was not involved in which are extremely important. And those people working in this subject know this. And they're not just aerospace engineers. These are top physicists in universities, okay? Mm -hmm. okay? And they're top designers in aerospace companies. Mm -hmm. And they've had the information put in their head too. And, but for whatever reason, almost everybody has been that knows the information has been in some way uh, put in the position that either their family has been threatened, they have been threatened, and they don't want to talk. And okay, well then let's, before we go on, why are you able to come forward? Okay, who I said, who gave you the green light? Okay, <clears throat> I can't answer that. All I can say is that the easiest way for me to say what I'm saying is my association with three Nordic people in Douglas on the Apollo program, okay? I worked with these guys, two young ladies and two really good looking Nordic guy. All right. And. <clears throat> So working with the three of them for three and a half years on the Apollo program, uh, who all three denied that they were Nordics, but everybody that was anybody in engineering knew they were, okay? <clears throat> I never said they were. They never said they were, but <clears throat> If you, if you can just try to visualize, um, I had 170 top engineers on the Apollo program working for me, okay? I was engineering section chief at Douglas. Uh, I had, I guess, worked my way up. Uh, 
I come up with approaches and concepts and I get these implemented by all my designers. Yes. Uh, where did my, where did some of my ideas come from? I have this very nice looking young lady who never stops uh, kidding. She, it's fun to go to work. Mm -hmm. She never stops kidding. She's always sticking it in and turning it. And not just that, but she's always stuffing things in my head. Mm -hmm. So like when I presented this complete redesign of the Apollo program to Dr. Von Braun and Dr. Debus at Redstone Arsenal, right. one of the most classified facilities on the planet. Yeah. I had a <laughs> six foot by six foot model in a great big box put on the DC-7 to fly down to the Redstone Arsenal, okay? Yes. I rented a truck. There weren't inside or closed trucks available. The only one that they had had just board sides on it. So here is this great big gray box that could be a nuclear bomb. I drive this thing and I've never driven this. The I gears know. on this in my life. I'm in a three piece business suit. I'm driving this truck with this bomb box. And you in the just back. drive it onto the base or something. And right? I wait just a second. <laughs> I get now my secretary had told me before I left, I've typed you an authorization as an exit as a uh, uh, allowance to go on board the base, okay? Um, you're never going to use it, okay? I said you're going to you're 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 going to get on base and you're not going to have anybody bother you, okay? So yes, I'm driving this truck a long straight road to get to the gates of the base. And she said, I told you before, Billy, telepathically, I'm driving the truck. I just keep going. So the <laughs> gates open. Okay. So great. Now off on the right hand wait, wait a minute. A great movie. Yeah. Okay. Off on the right hand side yeah. is this massive parking area for all of these trucks, all of the people to get on base, go through the security checks. Nobody it's one of the most classified bases on the planet. Sure. And the doors open, the gate opens, and none of the four police guards at the office, they didn't pick up their rifles and come out and start shooting. Nobody did. The rifles just stayed by the front door where okay, they stood. Okay, but is this Nordic mind control? Yes. Is it? Yes. Okay. So, so even, are, what are you telling me you're here because of Nordic mind control today? You know what I'm saying? I mean, <laughs> you know, is that what's happening? I mean, are these, you know, top admirals who've been in this game now since 42 at least, are they letting you come here because they've been persuaded to do so or because they've been mind controlled by Nordics to let you come? Okay. Uh, I have to say, really, I don't know. Uh, and I really don't know. I love that. Okay. That's awesome. Okay. That's okay. awesome. I would say that that's probably how you got, actually, I didn't just mean here disclosing, but actually here talking to me because I'm usually the most dangerous woman <laughs> out there. I mean, to tell you the truth, that's my reputation. So somebody letting you talk to me. I mean, I know the Nordics are cool with me. So now I know why you're here, because... You just answered it. All right. Okay. Yeah. Now, uh, <laughs> while we're still awesome. not believing the gates to open, I drive this truck through uh, a massive base that's covered with trees. You can't see the sky. Okay, you can't see where this tall building is that Von Braun's tower is. Right. I finally get to this. I drive right up. There's three levels of steps going up if you uh, come as a guest. 
but you can go into the back and drive in the back and get in there. So tell me why, you tell me why, four security guards come down the steps carrying a big rectangular dolly with four wheels. <laughs> okay? Yeah. They, I haven't said anything to them. They come over to the truck. Right. I'm out of the truck. They take the boards off the side, lay them down on the concrete. Uh, they pick up this model and they put it on this dolly. Why was that dolly available? Sure. I'm asking. Nordic mm -hmm. mind control again. Okay. So they carry this big box with the model in it, the command center for launch of Apollo, which nobody in NASA knows even exists. Because remember, that, that's, that's my concept of what you've watched on TV every time you watch an Apollo mission. That great big facility. Well, we got where, a lot uh, of questions yeah, about but, that. But just a, yeah. just a second. Our contract on the S-4B stage of the Apollo, the command stage section, okay? Right. Requires us to utilize a open hangar with bo doors on both ends of it uh, to check out our facility, our stage, and then assemble it on top of a outside uh, assembly area, okay? This is insane because we've got the most advanced circuits that have ever been designed for the computerized, the entire computerized operation of Apollo. Because remember, Germany was all mechanical. They were not, they did not use computers. Even back in those days. Back in those days. Now, this facility then, uh, has this massive uh, outside structure where you assemble your stages on this, and it's 270 foot high, okay, out in the open, and then somebody lights the engine, and we get the engines to operate, and it lifts off. The checkout is of everything is outside. The checkout of the vacant facilities and every part of the whole program is out in an environment with the doors open in a hangar. Okay, are you trying to tell me that because that it, it was somehow camouflaged and, and so people wouldn't look or couldn't see it or? No, I'm saying that our, our, our contract required us to do all of the assembly and check out of our stage, which is the controlling stage of Apollo, in an open hangar in the worst atmosphere that we can do it on the planet. Because the, hu the humidity at this location so uh, why is- why like that? I mean, this is, was yours, are you saying you made a redesign from that? Or I that said, I said to Dr. Debus and Dr. Von Braun in my briefing that I don't want to check, I don't want that hangar that you want me to check my stage in. I want, well, first of all, you guys with the V2s in Germany, uh, roughly 70, 68% of the time when you check it out and then you lift it, there's problems with your own V2s. Yeah. So, I'm going to check out my vehicle, first of all, in an inside closed area in the vertical position. And I'm going to keep it in the vertical position till I pick it up and put it on top of the lower stages. Okay, but I want to know why if, if the Nordics had this amazing technology and they were helping you and feeding you ideas for Apollo, why was Apollo so rudimentary? Is there a completely other Apollo that we never saw? Because we know that things happened on the moon once they got there and you said, you know, and I want to talk about all that. But you know what I'm saying? In other words, you're still talking about this module that has, you know, is a, basically a rocket. You know, it's like a tin can. Yeah. Um, 
that's that's old technology. Why did they let the humans continue with that uh, that kind of a, a, a design? They they could do what you would say would be uh, uh, a partial assistance to a country, and maybe we say they used the United States. Okay, now. Uh, the Germans had been playing with rockets, liquid rockets, for uh, way before World War II, and World War, War, even World War I, okay? <clears throat> so they have their command center, uh, the launch center, underneath the ground with concrete above it in a silo, an underground launch silo with a periscope up on top. They can look through. I said, we're not going to do that. I not only want my vehicle checked out in the vertical position and assembled that way, but I'm not going to use your underground launch facility for my cabinets full of support checkout and launch equipment. I want a uh, facility which will be a closed facility to assemble all of the stage and check them out. Okay, so my proposal to Debus and Dr. Von Braun was build a vertical assembly building, people. Okay, oh yes, it will be the biggest facility space-wise of any building on the planet. Who cares? This is what we need. I got from checking out the German V2s in Germany in a horizontal to a vertical and then encased in a white room. And actually, my proposal was a white room as atmosphere. Right. Air conditioned atmosphere. Mm -hmm. Because we were playing with advanced circuits and rocketry and, and uh, uh, communication system that nobody had, had ever done. So the chance for uh, something to go wrong was astronomical. And what I presented to Debus and Von Braun was not just buildings, to completely changed the whole checkout and launch at the Cape for production launches to the moon, okay? So if you'll remember in that book uh, selected uh, by extraterrestrials, there's a, there's a, a drawing in there yes. that shows Cape Kennedy, uh, Complex 39, and then a whole bunch of complexes all the way down this side mm -hmm. for uh, Launch Complex 39s, and then circles down here for these massive truck facilities to haul up all the equipment to build a 10,000 man naval base on the moon underground. Okay, yes, but did this get built the way you wanted it to? It finally did, yes. Really? The facility got built exactly the way uh, the, the four major changes to the Apollo program came out of 170 guys in a engineering area called uh, Launch Complex 39, which we designed at Douglas, okay? Okay, but you're still not, you didn't answer my question about the technology. So you're basically saying, because this is interesting, you're saying that the Nordics have some limitations in the way they help, in the way they interfere with planet Earth. Is that what you're kind of getting at? Okay, you're getting complicated, your questions, but we have to step way back. <clears throat> Uh, again, not really understood by the public, okay? <clears throat> yes, there are Federation facilities out in the galaxy where other extraterrestrials get together and uh, there's many different missions for many different types of programs. But we'll talk about one of them which cruises the galaxy 
and it has as many as 30 different extraterrestrial civilization people on board. It looks like the moon, okay? Uh, but it's a planet. I, I mean, it's not a planet, it's a vehicle. Right. Okay. So this cruises the galaxy. Is it a Dyson sphere or not? The what? Is it called a Dyson sphere? Uh, that's one term, but actually, uh, we're getting more complicated. <laughs> I can, uh, to, no, I need to answer your question. Um, when we got to the moon, we found out a lot of surprises, okay? <clears throat> the Draco reptilians were already there, and we, we, we knew because we had probes when we went non-manned probes that we sent around the moon. So we knew there were facility on the backside. We knew a whole lot that people didn't talk about. But we were in a position where uh, this moon is not a moon, okay? It's not your moon in the first place. Actually, this is not your planet. Uh, this is their laboratory. Okay. Right. Okay, uh, the Dracos, you mean, or the reptilians? Draco both? reptilian slash okay. reptilian. And I'm going to ask you what they all look like and all that, you know, at some point. Uh, okay. Because um, I know, okay, let's let's get to when it was, uh, was it Neil Armstrong landed on the moon and he said, he said that thing that you heard him say, and Michael wants to get real specific about this, so... Basically, there were seven huge craft there, and you said on one of the shows out there, you said um, that the, the reptilians actually showed up be, beneath their craft, and they gave the finger. Okay, they were parked around the side of the, uh, the crater, crater. Yeah. okay? They were not parked on it. They were right. floating above it. Okay, yeah. So there were hundreds of these nine-foot reptilian guys standing with their legs. Yeah, they were all the way across the, uh, the wow. under, uh, underneath their vehicles, okay, standing so on the crater. Feet, and what do they look like? Uh, uh, they're ugly looking, uh, lizard, alligator type people. They, wow. got, they got the same skin as the know. lizards got, right. okay? And terrible looking faces. Mm. But then they have the ability to shift and look like a human. All of them do. Okay? Okay, do you think Von Braun was a, a reptilian? No. You really don't? No. Okay. Uh, your president, yes. Oh, what? which one? Uh, George Bush Sr.? Yes. Yeah. Sure. And, and Bill Clinton and this guy you got, oh, just got rid of. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, they all were. Right. Okay. So, and they all have this ability to make themselves look like real uh, good looking people. And you're saying Trump does, isn't one? No, he's not. Okay. Well, that's a relief. And, uh, <laughs> and he knows more about this subject than people realize. It. Oh, okay. excellent. Uh, but trying to get back to your earlier question. Uh, These groups of extraterrestrials who work together, but are at war with other extraterrestrials, okay, mm -hmm. have these vehicles that look like a planet. Right. Like our moon is a vehicle. It's sure. a command center for this arm. Uh, easiest way to look at this is to put your arm out like this. and. You be the center of the galaxy, all the way out to here. There's four arms, arms on our galaxy. One of those arms has a place here which is called planet Earth. You're not downtown where all the action is in the galaxy. You're out here. You're in the area which galaxies, as they rotate, throw off, okay? So you're sitting here on the tip, near the tip of the Milky Way galaxy, you, Earth, 
okay? And what you need to do is visualize you're not, you are not Earth people, okay? You are extraterrestrials, nice guys out there. Mm -hmm. So you know that this little planet is going to get thrown off, maybe take a couple of weeks yet, but eventually it's going to get thrown off. Um, so, so that's why this is happening. This is why this is happening. Okay. okay? And 2,000 years from now, we'll probably be picked up with another galaxy. We're just floating out there. <clears throat> And this goes back to uh, the problem that we had before about the number of years that you can live. We'll talk about that later. But back to these command centers which operate throughout the galaxy to monitor bad guys and attempt to get them to back off. Uh, so isn't Phobos one of them? Uh, yes. Okay. And so uh, essentially, we have nice guys in there and even some bad people in the same vehicle. And they discuss wars and disagreements and this sort of thing. But back in their own planetary part of the galaxy, they may be at war with two of the same guys that are in this together. So this is like a center right. of information uh, sort of like a group of people who are trying to get along for certain specifications or certain events. <clears throat> Those guys uh, control your planet, I mean your moon, because your moon is a command center for this region of the galaxy, mm -hmm. not just the solar system. That's, that's small potatoes. Okay, the thing that's sitting right in here, which is you call your moon, okay, is a massive control center for this whole part of oh, the Milky Way galaxy. Okay, wow. Wow, wow is right. Well, what about Saturn? I thought Saturn was more like that. Uh, Saturn has large facilities on it too, but those are other agendas for other people. Okay, oh. some of which we have. Okay because we have mining companies. Let's take North American Aviation. Sure. Uh, Los Angeles Airport, that's where North American Aviation is, okay? Uh -huh. And you've seen on my block diagrams that are in my book what systems engineering really is, what controls the secret think tanks. Okay, uh, instead of a book or a document to do this, I came up with block diagrams. We have to have, to have one of those, we're going to need one of these, and we're going to need this for just the start of the program. As we get into this, we're going to change the phases of it into four different phases, concept phase, definition phase, acquisition phase, and operational phase. So now that's a eight, ten foot long piece of paper that's a foot high and it has every single block diagrams that are required to initiate that space program, okay? Every single one is in there. So those documents then are used in, in different manners to develop ICBMs. So I came up with a concept for really space concept, the military then used those for development of ICBMs and other weapon systems. But and that, the initiation of that is to understand the, our position on our association with extraterrestrials. That's what the block diagram is for. All these events that have to take place to interface with extraterrestrials. What do you mean? Okay, that's very complex what you just said. It is very complicated. So you're talking about yourself having a diagram, having been the person who cr creates a diagram that the entire sort of maybe all the militaries are going to follow that's going to 
diagram out our relationships with these with with the rest of the yeah ET we races? used what turned out later to be a standard requirement this block diagram thing for every weapon system that any of the military has whether it's air force navy marines doesn't make any difference your company designing whatever go back to the pentagon and you propose a, a weapon system you're going to have to be if you get that proposal you're going to have to be controlled by this 375 document which uh, i came up with for the apollo program and I submitted that to Von Braun, and that was one of the four programs of changing the entire NASA program. Okay, so the first use of this was for ICBMs. I took that system and, and defined the entire Apollo program and the missions, because we had, they had several missions, my group, in the secret think tank came up with 44 separate missions extended till to the year 2000, 1999. So the Apollo program was supposed to not just go to the moon, pick up the rocks, take the photographs and come back. <laughs> yeah, the sure. Apollo program was to take us out into our solar system, build naval stations on every habitable uh, planet or its moon, okay? Right. And then the next phase was to go to the 12 closest stars, Alpha Centauri, Alpha Centauri being the first, put naval stations, bases on all of its planets, except we stopped that one because it had two suns and the radiation factor was not, we couldn't do it. But 11 other stars, the 11 closest stars to you, okay? And you're saying it's been done? And I'm saying that's what we plan on doing. Okay, you planned starting with Apollo, and you planned That is the Apollo mission. No, that planned. is the Apollo oh, mission. Oh, that's just Apollo, okay. Did it happen? Uh, no. It got stopped, right? Yeah. And it got stopped by the reptilians? Yeah, they said no, no. Okay, now this diagram that you're saying, this, this block diagram that mm -hmm. is, the militaries are all following, it basically is, in a sense, your de you kind of your design initially. It came through you, but it must have been downloaded to you somehow through the, from the Nordics, okay. saying what Earth people were going to be allowed to do. Is yeah. that what it's saying? Okay. What kind of weapons they could or couldn't build? It's, it was not for weapons. It was for us, and actually that's in my book. Right. Um, uh, it was for us to go out into the galaxy. Everything that's necessary to build a, a, a transport or a vehicle. Go out in the galaxy, have communications with other extraterrestrials out there, and set up businesses with them. Right. Maybe we could mine stuff for them. Maybe we had certain materials they don't have. We could market these. Okay. Um, they may have things that we want to buy. Mm -hmm. Set up communications with other civilization people out in the galaxy. That's what the first block diagram was for, and that's what the mission was to have originally been, what we recommended, okay? Yeah. Now, yes, uh, Nordics, put that stuff in Billy Tompkins' mind, and he runs with this ball, okay? But you've got it in the book. I mean, that's what our thrust was. It was not military. Then the military picks up this document, and they run with that of every military program anybody wants. Okay, but when you say the military picked it up, I mean, here you are kind of almost embedded in the military. They, and, you, and you're dealing with von Braun and Debus. Now, they're Germans, Yeah. okay? So there is some kind of uh, interaction going on between still Germany, the U.S., and then Project Paper Kit yeah, bringing right. over all the Nazi scientists. Yes. And at some point, we're being infiltrated. It's clear in your book that you, and especially your close friend that you worked with a lot, you used to talk in the dialogue of the book, 
you're always saying someone is interfering, someone is on a higher level trying to manage this situation. Implement. Here. Implement the situation. Okay. So you're having both white hat guys yeah. out there, okay, and we got black hat guys out yes. there. And uh, they're both influencing us. And they still are. They have their agendas. And they still are, yes? Yes. Yeah. To, as we're talking, they're still doing this. Yes. Okay? It, it hasn't stopped. Okay, before we continue, and I want to take a short break, I'd let you drink some water. I, want, my, I, know, I don't want to leave this subject uh, where Michael can ask his question, okay. that he has, uh, make sure that he got his question answered about, again, back to um, uh, Neil Armstrong on the moon and the, and the seven huge craft and all the reptilians standing there. Um, you wanted to ask a question. Yeah. So. Um, I just wanted to back up for just a quick second. When Bill talks about um, classified documents not being stamped, that's absolutely correct because that is the procedure that Kelly Johnson followed at the Skunk Works in Burbank. When they were doing the F-80, the U-2 spy plane, the A-12, and the SR-71, none of those documents were stamped top secret. That was per Kelly Johnson, so you're absolutely yeah. correct about that. Yeah. <laughs> uh, Crazy, but yes, you're right. Yeah. So, Bill, are we to believe then that you are the genesis of the vehicle assembly building at the Kennedy Space Center? You're the genesis for that idea? Yeah, but that okay. actually is for the NOVA program. Okay. Okay. NOVA, NOVA vehicles. In the book, I think there's seven of them in the one picture. You see seven different types of NOVAs. You see the the Apollo vehicle, it's over in the corner, it's a little tiny thing. Then you see these great big things that are 10 times the size of Apollos, okay? Those are all trucks. They're, they're trucks to haul up uh, boring machines for the moon, to bore into the moon, to find areas where we can do our construction of a 10,000 man naval operation and research base on the moon. That's what our Apollo program first phase is. Not just go to the moon and pick up the rocks. We were going to the moon to a program that actually operated, this is 1963, it was operational till 1999. Okay, the moon, the Apollo moon program. Okay, so all okay, these. But it, I mean, it, it got stopped, and then it got it. It continued. I mean, it went black. I guess is what happened. Yeah. It, uh, but do you want some water? Yeah. Does anyone else want to take a short break?